Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. It's time out. A special guest is joining us. Jonathan Brook is here. Hi, Mitch. Thanks for coming in. My pleasure. You're actually here at Sweetwater working I really in the am studio. here. You're here. You are I'm here really for real. Here. <laughs> You're in the studios. I am. What are you working on? Working on some new songs. Yeah? Yeah. I have some new little ditties I wanted to try out. Nice. Nice. You got the whole crew going over there. We got the crew. We got we got Mark Hornsby. We got Nick DiVirgilio. We got uh, Don Carr. We got Phil Nash. Mm -hmm. And then we got a couple of ringers in there today. Brought some guys up from Nashville. We, we had to. We just, you know, what are you going to do? We're close enough. Right. So we got Rory Hoffman and Dave, I forget his last name. Martin. Mart Dave, Dave Martin. Dave Martin, amazing bass player. Ridiculous. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah, and it's so cool because, like, if we decide, okay, we need to put let's say, euphonium on this, for instance. Like, we can just sort of get it out of the warehouse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if we have a euphonium in the warehouse. <laughs> They'd find one, though, if you needed one. Yeah, see? <laughs> it's a, a can-do kind of place. Right. Yeah. right, exactly, exactly. And then you're doing a uh, recording workshop this weekend. I am, yeah. We're doing a sort of recording, engineering, mixing kind of shebangy, mm -hmm. me and Mark. Right, so people are going to come in and watch you making music. Yeah. Did it's you? always better that way, actually. Yeah? You know, then, then you're in your best behavior, and sometimes... With an audience, you are—I don't know—it's like being on stage. You know, like you, it's like your A game plus. I'm right. not sure what it is. It kicks your butt in a good way. So, in the studio, you prefer to have people there. Or you aren't one of those um, isolate yourself. And I'm not one of those self-conscious isolate yourself. You know, slit your wrists every time you need to do a vocal take. Persons, I, I, I actually do better if I'm being watched and there's pressure and time constraints and budget constraints, which is how it's been for so long. Right, that's always the case, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Actually, one time I was recording with Bob Clearmountain. Mm -hmm. um, we were we were kind of figuring out, he's usually a mix engineer, but we were right. actually recording and, you know, tracking in his living room, basically. So we moved all the couches and we, you know, put the dogs upstairs and we were tracking the living room and there were these Japanese guys who had come by to talk to him about, I don't know, mixing something of theirs and he had forgotten. So we were in the middle of doing this whole vocal session on this one last track on the record Steady Pull. And he's like, Joe, you know, you don't mind if this whole Japanese contingent comes in and watches. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I guess that's <laughs> fine. Right. And ever since then, it's been like, oh, I sang so much better. Mm -hmm. Let's do that again. Invite everybody down. Invite everyone in. Have a session. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. What about when you're writing? Do you isolate yourself when you're then writing? Then I'm isolated, paranoid. I'm a total jerk. I'm insane, I'm depressed, I'm weeping, I'm in my pajamas making toast, doing laundry, knitting, anything when I hit the wall and I'm not getting the thing. Because I, you know, I, I don't believe in forcing a song into existence. Right. You know, you have to push it only so far and then you have to go do laundry or make toast mm -hmm. or jump off the roof. <laughs> Hopefully not. And the, the weird irony is that, I mean, I've been doing this a long time. I've made, what, 11, 12 records, and it never gets easier. Hmm. It's the same abyss. So you don't have a formula that you just say, okay, I here we go? I wish I did. I wish I did. I really admire people who are like, I'm going to write every morning from 8 to 12, and then I'm going to, you know, do some demos and see what I got, and I just, I'm at the whim of the muse. Right, right. So you do these other activities dishes, laundry, whatever, to distract your conscious yep. mind to let your subconscious work and on And it the... totally works. Hmm. Something about menial labor, right. you know, like washing things or even knitting, like the, the monotony of it and the fact that you just, you know, you have to count 30 things and then you do the other thing and then, oh, there's the chorus. It's kind of... I don't know. That's, it works for me. Does it show up full-blown in your head or do you get a lyric idea or is it music that comes first or how does that work? Um, it's sort of probably 50-50 in terms of the gifts mm -hmm. <laughs> that the are gifts. bestowed. Right. Uh, and it's usually a morning gift. Like, I'm gifted in the morning. Mm -hmm. Nighttime, I'm pretty useless. Uh, but I'd say it's a 50-50 gifting of l melody and, and lyric. Mm -hmm. um, and I just have to remember it. So I have like a gazillion voice memos that are... I was going to say, do you capture it on a <laughs> yes. phone or something like that? <laughs> on the phone. Right, right, nice, nice. N you uh, recently co-wrote with Katy Perry. I did. Greg Wells. How does the co-writing process work compared to when you're working by yourself? It's, m it's more fun and uh, more delicate in a way because there are three of you and you, you have to be diplomatic and you have to concede certain things that you might have been attached to or precious about on your own. Um, in the best scenarios, it's like Christmas, you know, it's like if the minds are meeting and you're adding to each other's 
whatever is happening, whatever magic ele electricity is in the air. It's like, oh, and then we could do this, and then and that's what it was like with Katie and Greg. I mean, mm -hmm. Greg's just a monster track builder, and he, you know, he would respond to. I mean, I came in with a kalimba. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go right with Katy Perry. What might she not have in her arsenal with having worked with every single person in the whole universe of pop hits? Oh, uh -huh. no one's tried kalimba with <laughs> Katy Perry. So I brought this little kalimba, and she's like, what's that? And Greg's like, what's that? I'm like, oh, it's just my little kalimba. And um, we ended up building this whole bed of a track around this kalimba motif I had. And then it went from there, and she's like, what if this? And then I'm like, what if this? And then... You know, that's how the track that actually made it to her record happened. Right. So nice. it was super fun. She's a badass. Am I allowed to say that? Sure. Okay. She's a badass. <laughs> She's super cool, super fun, killer singer, mm -hmm. and a lot of fun to be around. Wow. Sounds like a great experience. Really fun. Yeah. So you're also a playwright. Yeah. <laughs> and a uh, stage actor. Yeah. Tell us about the, uh, the, the play. I, um... So let's see, I'll try to give you the tinier version. I moved my mother in with me in 2010. She had Alzheimer's and was no longer independent. And I realized this was a crisis, I must do something. So I moved her in with me. Mom was a poet, she was a clown. She was an amazing mom, she also had four noses. So the, the play is, I ended up writing a play about our two years together. She passed away after about two years. Um, but she had these four prosthetic noses. She had had skin cancer earlier in her life. And so she ended up with these, they made her four mm -hmm. noses. Um, so along with the dementia and the clown and the poet and being very silly, she had the added theater of her noses mm -hmm. and she had the best sense of humor of all about them so often she, she you know something would happen or we'd make up a new song or you know her nose would fall off and we'd write a song about it or and she, she would always say bully that's my nickname are you getting this down <laughs> we should make a play out of it and that's what ended up happening I realized I guess early on in caring for her that our story was pretty precious in the best way, and that it was going to be more than my next record. I needed to write about it. I needed to, to get it down, right. um, because some of, our, some of our banter was just crazy. No one would believe it if I didn't tell this story. And also, everyone is facing some part of this same story. Sure. Everyone knows someone, or will be with someone, or has cared for someone um, facing dementia. So anyway, long, longer story short, I, I ended up writing this musical play about it. I wrote 10 songs that sort of weave in and out of the storytelling of me telling you about me and my mother. It's a love story, really. Mm -hmm. um, I orchestrated it for cello and electric guitar with my guitar player, Ben Butler. And we took it to Off-Broadway, and we had a great success. Right. Uh, we got lovely reviews, and I've been touring a little more around the country, and I'm planning to do more of it because it... Every time I do it, it it really strikes a chord. People, they get it. They recognize right. themselves or someone they know. And they love that I am poking fun at this very dark thing. Death, dementia, you know, elder care. Mm -hmm. um, but at the root of it is this love story. And right. I think that's what sort of buoys it along. And, and it's, it's actually very funny because mom was hysterical. Right. That's awesome. That's awesome. And you brought it out as an album. Yes. As well. Also, the songs are on on a on a record, and it's you know it's not like an you know Broadway soundtrack. It's not like blah, 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 and I have to sing now. It's more it's a Jonathan record. Right. But it is the songs that are in the play. Right. Right. Your previous record was The Works. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that one. That's based on Arlo Guthrie's archival Woody. songs. Woody, I'm sorry, Woody Guthrie's yeah. uh, archival songs. Uh, that was another great adventure. I was invited into the Woody Guthrie archives to perhaps write one or two songs for this big folk benefit concert for the Philly Folk Society. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't, I mean, I wasn't a, a Woody fan or aficionado or anything. I, you know, I knew this land is your land. I knew some of his history, but I didn't, I was like, okay, cool idea. Let's see what happens. And I fell in love. Mm -hmm. 
I started pouring through his journals and his letters and these little scribbled hand notes on napkins and wrapping paper and it was such a treasure trove of poetry and love songs and crazy journal entries and I started piecing things together that maybe the people in there before hadn't thought to take the liberty to do and I you know I kept asking Nora who's Woody's daughter mm -hmm. and she is the the gatekeeper of the archives and I said like Nora I really think that this journal entry from 1946 I think that's the missing piece to this tattered piece of paper I found from when he was in the mental hospital in Brooklyn is you know are you cool if I can I merge these two things she's like of course don't don't worry about Woody, he'll be fine. Like, this is about you, this is your record. Right. Make this your record. And it was such a great gift mm -hmm. and a great trust that she bestowed on me and it, it turned out beautifully. And right. of course, you know, Steve Gadd and I was gonna say, an Joe incredible Sample, band, yeah. <laughs> Christian McBride are on the record and Bob Clearmountain recorded and mixed it, so. Right, so know, tell the, us about working with those guys. The didn't suck. <laughs> right, exactly. Tell us about working with those guys. Did you go in with parts for them to play or did you say, here's the chord chart and make something up? Or how did you I made it? charts, mm -hmm. rudimentary charts. Actually, I had my friend make them because I'm not really a trained <laughs> chart maker. Right. I, and I didn't want them to be at all screwy, I want, you know, because it, these are like the guys. Mm -hmm. And I only had two days, and I, because that's all I could afford, and we, the, we did the whole record in two days. And basically, I, I would sing them the song in the room. We were at Avatar in New York. I would sing them the song once and tell them a story about it, but not too much. Right. And especially Steve, he doesn't want, he doesn't want you to tell him much at all. He's like, just play it, give me a little something, but then don't say anything else. <laughs> right. And then we would track it, mm -hmm. and it would be done. Like, maybe two takes. Nice. And then it always felt like if we did a third, which was rare, we were already done. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, their, their first ideas those guys are the ideas. Right. I mean, they're just... So you catch it when they're fresh and it's, it's new to them. Yeah, and they, I mean, they came up with stuff that I wouldn't, I, it just, I didn't, I was just like hold, hanging on, trying to keep up really, <laughs> you know, because I was tracking live too, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just trying to hold my own there with the vocal and the guitar. Mm -hmm. There's one actually great thing that happened was, there's a song called You Ought to Be Satisfied Now, where Joe was playing, early and he didn't have he didn't have my guitar in his headphones he had my vocal but he didn't have my guitar because my guitar is doing this frantic six eight thing okay but steve started playing this against my really frantic guitar part mm -hmm. and the chart was in six eight or whatever, I think, it, yeah, I think it was 6'8". Um, so Joe kept like looking at the chart and being like, what the fuck, what's going on here? Because I, you know, I can't, I don't, I'm hearing this, it sounds like, you know, four to me. Like, but he just like, he did the take and he went with Steve. So mm -hmm. he, you know, his whirly part is like groovy and greasy and slow and doing that two thing. And I'm like, bing, 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 bing. I'm like, what's going on here, you guys? Like, what's going on? Like, aren't you reading the chart? Like, what? no one's going with me. Like, how am I going to hold this against you guys? And then we went to listen to the take, and I'm like, holy moly, that is the hippest thing I've ever heard. Like, and it was because Joe went with Steve, not hearing my thing, and he didn't say anything about like this chart's messed up. Right. And then it, it was this, like, br brilliant mistake, I guess, but it, I mean, Steve's thing was intentional. Like, he knew what he was doing because he was listening to everything, but right. it was just... So as long as you were all locked to To me, the that's, drums. like, one of the hippest tracks yeah, I've ever great. done. I just love how it turned out. That's great. But at the time, I'm panicking, thinking, like, <laughs> how am I going to get through this? Oh, my God, I can't, I can't. Right, right. So when you normally when you go into the studio, say when you come here or, or whenever you're working on, on new material, do you have a pretty clear idea of how you want it to sound? Often I 
do, and it's it's a sort of larger, more vague, like sonically, I want it to be intimate. I want it small. I want my voice to be here in your face. And I want weird, I want, you know, I want bass clarinet and accordion. I want these sort of flavors of these sounds. Um, I, I try not to dictate parts to mm -hmm. like get there and sort of hear how the timbre of people's particular voices. Um, but so often I'm in the studio when I'm like, oh, here's the melody you need to play. So it, right. I don't sort of chart everything out meticulously before I go in. I like to sort of see what happens. Because mm -hmm. there's so much chemistry and you want people to bring their own personality to the, to the gig. Right, right. I guess if you're going to do every note yourself, you may as well play every note yourself. Yeah. I mean, with the last, with the Mom record, Rob Mathis did five arrangements on it. Mm -hmm. So I sort of, I, I definitely sort of left it to him to like, I think you got that covered. Like, here's the sort of palette I hear, but, you know, I think you'll, right. I think you'll make the right choices. Is that scary, letting go of that control like that? Nah, I don't mind. I've been lucky enough to work with guys like Rob Mathis and Gil Goldstein and people that just wow me every time. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, if I'm making mod modifications, it's more like, mm, can they just lay out on this part? Or, you know, maybe shape it a little more like this, but it's, it's all there. Right. And they're so brilliant. Right. What about when it comes to the, the mix of the record and the overall kind of tonality and sound of it? When you're working with somebody like Bob Clearmountain, obviously he's mixed tons of great, great records. Do you have direction for him, or how, does, how do you approach that? I do, I do have a little bit, uh, but I, again, I, I so, he's, uh, he's, he's always right. <laughs> 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 so often if I'll be like, what if, can we try this? Or like, mm, not sure about that, and we'll do a little loop-de-loop, -loop and then often we'll come back to him, you know, his initial impulse being right, so. But right. He's, he's totally cool about like, okay, sure, yeah, let's try that. Uh, yeah, but again, I, I'm I'm so lucky. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been surrounded by really, really gifted people. Yeah, it's tremendous. But it's nice to be able to try all the different ideas and see where uh, things you never For know sure. where something's going to lead. Yeah, and when I mean Bob and I actually made Steady Pull together, so we mm -hmm. we were building those tracks, you, you know, bit by bit. And he kept saying, "Well, I'm not really a good producer. I'm not really a good producer. I don't really know. I don't know. I don't know." And then we'd be like, "Well, what about this?" And he's like, "Well, I think this." And you're like, "Bob, of course you know what you're doing." You know. And, and he actually played bass on one song. He's a decent bass player. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, That's where he started, correct, as a, as a bass I player? Think I think so, yeah. There yeah. are pictures of him All right. in All his right. youth. So that was your, your third solo album, um, correct? Plum, Ten Cent Wings, and then Steady Pull. Am I doing that right? Something yeah. like that? Yeah. Um, there, yep. So were you fully transitioned from having done the duo records with the story and working on your own? Was that a big transition for you to make? Yeah. I mean, Plum was the first solo record, and that was probably the scariest transition of all the transitions I've made. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly because I, I, I had really been identified as this duo, mm -hmm. you know, and these, these two voice harmonies that were so gorgeous. And, you know, we were known for our blend and the beautiful dissonances that we would hold on to longer right. than most people would be comfortable. Uh, so that was, you know, that was scary to be like, all right, well, this is a singular voice now. How am I going to make that translate? And yes, I will always love harmony. I will always love those tight clusters and, you know, coming up with counterpoints and melodic vocal ideas. But, um, you know, it was w definitely one of those dark stretches of like, can I do this? Can I do this? Oh, I, you know, I think I can. Mm -hmm. I think I can. Wow, I can. And I love that record. Right. Had to be liberating. Yeah, after the scary part. Right. <laughs> Get past the fear, and then it's fun. Right? Yeah, and then and then I guess there was another scary transition into into producing. You know, and like Steady Pull in particular was the first thing I'd done without, you know, a real, quote unquote, producer like pre-production and parts in the computer and trying this and this and this and coming up with everything in advance and we did kind of wing it. And, and so that was one of those other, like, well, wait a minute, I can do this. I can write a string chart. I can figure out what, you know, what, what, what I want the guitar to sound like. I can figure out who should play what. Sure. Huh. I guess I can do this, too. Right. Right. That's great. Yeah. So you've had uh, a lot of success 
placing your songs into TV, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, other shows as well, Disney films and, yeah. and things. How does that process work? Do you, do you say, this song would be great for Disney, or do they come to you, or how, how did all that happen? In my experience, uh, there have been a few things that we hustled, but for the most part, it's, oh, let's call Jonathan. You know, the, the, my big Disney song, which is called I'll Try, mm -hmm. uh, that was because my friend Bambi, believe it or not, who worked at Disney for 19 years, said, I think Jonathan should write this song. Um, you know, we're doing this feature of it's the sequel to Peter Pan. It's the first, you know, animated Peter Pan thing we've done since the original. Right. But Jonathan needs to write this song because she's perfect at 12-year-old angst. <laughs> and <laughs> the song is all about this, you know, 12-year-old girl's trajectory from... You know, I can't do it too, I'll try, mm -hmm. and I'm, I can do it. And um, thank God she had faith in me, and, and the song prevailed, you know, through a couple of different shifts in directors and producers, but the song was sort of the constant right. uh, of that particular movie. And same thing with Buffy, and because um, it turns out Joss Whedon was aware of me, and so I think it was his idea to put Inconsolable in the show. And then he came back to me for the theme song for... Dollhouse, mm -hmm. his other TV venture. So I ended up writing the, the theme for that. Right, right. It gives you a lot of, a lot of exposure. Yeah. Really good. I just wish they hadn't canceled the damn show. <laughs> I love that song. Right. I love the show, too. Yeah, sure. Sure. Well, it's great. Congratulations on so much success with that. Well, thank and you. As, yeah, as you're, I, uh, you're, you're reminding me, like, oh, I have a lot to be grateful for. You've done a lot of great things, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and we're, yeah. we're so glad to have you here. It's such a thrill. It's, yeah, it's been great it's having you It's such a thrill. Studio. It's an amazing place. Oh, thank and, you. And the vibe is incredible. Everyone has been so lovely. Great. That's it's the way it should fun. be. It's super, super fun. Right. right. Well, we can't wait to hear what comes out of the studio. Oh, my God. I think it's going to be fun. Bass stuff. clarinet. Bass clarinet and accordion. <sighs> right? There What's better than that? That's it. Such a pleasure to meet you. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks for taking time with us today. Anytime. And thank you for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute. I'm Mitch Gallagher.